Welcome to the proving differential equations in cyber-physical systems part of the logical foundations and cyber-physical systems lecture series. Differential equations are useful for their incredible descriptive power. They do describe even quite complicated physical processes in simple ways. Um, so a solution of a differential equation can be a very complicated object, even if the differential equation is rather easy, which means the thing we've done before the break is a stupid idea, where we said, listen to our reflex from when we first learned about differential equations. If somebody hands a differential equation to you, your first impulse is, let's solve this thing. Don't do that, ever. <coughs> Why? Because you've undone the beauty of differential equations. What you've done is you've taken a very simple artifact, the differential equation, which is by definition simple in a certain sense, and you've turned it into this solution which is more complicated because the differential equation in a simple form is trying to capture a complicated process in simple local ways. In other words, there's a huge complexity difference between you know, the local description of a differential equation and its global behavior. In fact, the same is also true in the loop. Right? What a loop describes globally, all the sequence of states that it visits is quite complicated. But the loop body beautifully tells us you know, the generator of what will happen over and over again. So we don't remember the behavior of a loop by writing down every state that it visits over time. No, 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 no. We will remember the loop body and say, oh, and now this process keeps repeating. I can generate everything I want from that later on if I just remember the succinct description. So let's exploit that phenomenon now for proofs, just for different equations. We want to reason locally about global behavior of continuous systems. And of course, you know, this very simple differential equation, which even happens to be linear, second derivative of position is minus that position has a sine function <coughs> as a solution, which may not be so complicated because you've, you've seen it a bunch, but if you expand it out, it's already more complicated. And the point is certainly that you know, a linear ODE has a tri trigonometric function as a solution, and this uh, differential equation, for example, doesn't even have an elementary closed form solution at all. So very simple ODEs can, have, can be descriptions for very complicated processes. In fact, after Stanley's beautiful illustrations, we've, uh, we've seen a lot about what happens in the linear case. Uh, and we've seen also, we, we've sharpened our intuition, we've seen those sets move around, which is probably the biggest weakness of our Chimera X prover, that it doesn't show you a picture all the time. But it does show you, you know, questions that you need to answer for the proofs. However, turning that around, at least you can do verification for quite non-trivial, non-linear systems. And that's what we're heading. So what we need is something like that. Something that is like an invariant, but it's an invariant not for a loop. It's an invariant for a differential equation. So if we're interested in proving that always after an ODE runs, some post condition P holds true, <coughs> then what we need to do is find a, it's called a differential invariant that is true in the beginning, that is somehow preserved when the ODE runs. OK, I guess I'll have to become a little more precise about the question marks here. And which finally implies the post condition that you were interested in. Easy enough principle, all we need to do is fill in the blanks in the question marks here. So for reference, this is what we used to do, where we said in the previous lecture that you know, a property is true of a differential equation if and only if for all times the property is true for the solution y at time t, uh, which is beautiful if we happen to have that solution. So what does, this what does this correspond to again? Here's a solution of the differential equation, whereas the rest is plotting the vector field, or sort of plotting the right-hand side of a differential equation. At every point in the state space, this little arrow indicates which way to go. And this is a beautiful local description. And then here is a global solution that says, should I start here and always follow my nose? Pardon me. Always follow the vector chain of the differential equation. Always go in the direction that the differential equation right-hand side tells me to then, well, I guess I end up there. If I have some bad blue regions that I don't want to go into, then, of course, what I can do is start my system at each of those states. That's just infinitely many. Uh, then compute a solution in each of them, which is, OK, of course, infinitely many compu uh, solution computations. And then ask the solution at each of those points in time, you know, infinitely many, 
uh, whether I happen to be in the bad blue region. And you know, after I'm done with this process, uh, I will have known what is going on, but the proof is going to keep me busy for an infinite amount of time. I don't have that much patience, so we need to find a better way of doing that. But the intuition is simply that, well, the vectors already tells us everything we need to know. The d differential equation tells us what it's, what it's doing. It tells us, if I happen to be here, I go that way. If I happen to be here, I go that way. If I happen to be here, I go that way. If I happen to be here, I go that way. Now, if these vectors ever point from safe into unsafe, oh boy, could we be in trouble because our system would be following that direction at that moment. But if they never do that, if they only ever point from safe to safe and from safe to safe and from safe to safe and safe to safe and safe to safe everywhere, then our intuition is, well, I guess the system must be safe all the time too. We don't know exactly that our aircraft will land in Paris at the end of the day, but that wasn't the question. The question is, will it be somewhere safe? Okay, let's make that happen. So we want a formula that remains true in the direction of the dynamics, which if I just illustrate the region where everything is fine is this funny little funnel here, then if the dynamics always pushes us inside and never outside of the set, I guess we're good to go. Yeah. Um, so we don't know exactly where the system evolves to, just that it remains somewhere in the region. And um, all we need to do is define what that really means to always stay inside the region in logical good ways. Let's look at a guiding example, which by sheer coincidence actually sort of is the same one uh, that Stanley looked at, um, at least in the first case. It's not written that way around, but it'll, you'll see in a minute that it has sort of the same behavior. This is a differential equation system, uh, and we ask whether you know, the sum of squares of the individual variables is always r square, and if we plot it, then you know, its behavior will indeed be always rotating in the circle. Um, and then we've already seen what you could be doing in such a, such a sip, s case. But I insist on wanting to have a proof for it. So what do we do? What do we do to prove that indeed v squared plus w squared is always r squared? Well, we could be computing solutions, but then we're already lost, my argument. Huh? So instead, what we can be doing for this is basically figure out, so this is the expression I'm interested in, v squared plus w squared minus r squared, which is sort of the expression of interest when I'm interested in this equation. How does this change? How does this change locally? That's a derivative question, right? OK, all right. So what's the derivative of v squared plus w squared minus r squared? Zero. Why zero? Okay, so differentiating the right side, that should be zero because the derivative of zero is always zero. That's very good. Differentiating the left side, I'm not sure I immediately see why that should be zero. Two times right. So this is definitely something like two times v plus two times w minus two times r, right? Well, hold on a minute there. Uh, is it really? Shouldn't it also depend on how V changes, and how W changes, and how R changes? So R doesn't change, so that's easy, I guess. Yeah? So the derivative of R squared actually is zero because it's a constant, and the constants don't change, period, done. But you know, V squared and W squared, the, you know, of course, two V is a good reflex, and two W is a good reflex, but we need to keep track also of, well, and how does V change, and how does W change? So speaking of which, how does W change, and how does V change? Anybody know? It's written in the ODE, so why don't we do the obvious of you know, plugging in the left-hand side of the ODE with the right-hand side of the ODE. So let's do exactly that, right? So we write this down. We just normalize it in sequent normal form due to Gerhard Genson. Um, then we write down this thing with 2v, v prime, never mind all these details. We somehow replace the left-hand side of the ODE with the right-hand side of the ODE. And out comes 2vw plus 2w minus v equals 0, which, who proves that again? It's a triviality, right? Of course, these two are equal because um, yeah, I'm subtracting the same term from itself. So it's very easy to prove that this is indeed true, and the star usually marks in these proofs that I'm done. So this is a very short four-line proof for this fact. No solutions involved. Uh, the only beauty problem with it is that I have been utterly imprecise about what kind of reasoning I'm allowing and doing here. 
and sound. This is you know, the conditio sine qua non, the condition without which logic couldn't be. So let's make that one precise. But the gutting example is still going to be a useful one for us. So what we do is we will devise a number of reasoning principles about fancy differential equations. The first one of them is what we've seen sort of by intuition now, which is differential invariance. So this principle that if we have a vector field and we're interested in solutions and whether they get into bad blue regions, they don't have to be blue, OK? Whether they get into bad regions, then we can like, work with their derivatives somehow, yeah? do derivative reasoning for these guys. The other principle, also from logic, is called differential cuts, which say if I have a proof that I cannot enter this red region, then I can cut the red region out of the state space. No loss. If I have a proof that I can't go there, I can delete it. Having done that, now maybe I look at my vector field and say, ah, now it's like this. I also happen to find a proof that I cannot go into this red region. So I guess I can cut that out of my state space too. And then I look at my state space and say, no wonder that I'm safe because the bad blue regions all disappeared. But they have disappeared after a number of reasoning steps as I was transforming the state space. So think of differential cuts. They actually, you know, they're actually sort of the differential equations, analog of Gödel's nonsense, of uh, Gerhard Gensen's cut principle. So prove a lemma and then use it. But let's make that work for differential equations. But you can also think of their intuition as, suppose you build a wonderful, fancy, crazy robot with a beautiful controller for it. The first thing you do is you prove that this robot stays on the surface of the Earth. It doesn't fly, right? So then from that point on, you can restrict the, in principle, three-dimensional state space to the two-dimensional plane on the ground. The next thing you do is you prove that, well, now that I know that it's always on the surface of the Earth, I prove that it will not leave the highway, neither to the left nor to the right. All of a sudden, your state space can be limited to, well, here's the stretch of highway, and everything else in the world is irrelevant, because you prove that your controller won't go there anyhow. <coughs> then you look at that and say, well, having done that, I also, now that I know that it's on the road, I will also prove that it will always stay on the current lane. I can restrict the state space to the current lane. Having done that, now I can worry about the question whether on the current lane my distance to the car in front of me is safe or not. You know? But at least I'm no longer worrying about things that put, could potentially fly around or all kinds of things. This is the sequence of differential cuts that you're actually doing under these circumstances. First your system could do anything, then you figure out more and more and more about it and can then restrict the state space correspondingly. Differential ghosts, they're yet another awesome principle, also from logic. How they work is basically if you have a differential equation that has nasty behavior. Uh, yes. So here it seems that, at least in the example we read, that uh, the reduction is also in the dimension. Of no, it's not. The reduction here, I'm sorry, the reduction for the differential cuts is in the size of the state space, uh, not that that has a very precise measure. The measure is you're conjoining a new conjunct into your evolution domain constraint, as you will see in the next slide, and that's the reduction. You make the <coughs> size of your, at least if you would take size as the Lebesgue measure, you're decreasing the Lebesgue measure. That also isn't quite right, but because you could be conjoining in uh, things that are measure theoretically um, non different than what you had before, but you still gain a, a knowledge from it. But that's the intuition to have. You're not changing the, you're not changing the dynamics, you're not changing the dimension. All you're doing is you're changing the set within which your system is but evolving. Okay, good point. In that, in that, yes, yes, awesome. I, yes, I love it. In, in that case, you're totally right. You you happen to still live in the three-dimensional world, but only a two-dimensional sub manifold of it is relevant. So you can then do a change of coordinates, which is what this thing is about, and. Uh, you know, continue your analysis even in 2D, but, but that's not married to the differential cut principle. That's something slightly different logically. Here it is. There's the surprising principle is actually the other way around. The surprising principle that is sometimes you have a dynamics that you cannot understand because it's too complicated. For example, what you cannot understand if the dynamics is plotted like this is, is it above zero all the time or not? You know, if you look at the trend of this, this is getting worse over time, right? So if you do any derivative or trend analysis, they're all going to go on red alert, red alert and tell you, oh, things are getting, think of an aircraft, right? If this is what your aircraft is doing and zero is the ground, you will shout at the pilot. Yeah? It, it so happens that you stay above ground, but only marginally so, right? But in order to see that, 
you can't look at the current trend and say, well, the altitude is not actually getting any better. But you have to do something else. And the something else that you need to do is you need to bump up the dimension of your system and do something that's numerically stupid. You add a new different equation into your system, y prime equals g of xy, such that this increased dimensional set where you arbitrarily made up the ODE as you saw fit for the sake of your argument, the two of them together, the, the old state variables and the funny ghost, they're, they're made up, they're not real, they're just you know, kid stories. These ghost differential equations all of a sudden allow you to say, well, the change of x I cannot understand, but I can very much understand how x changes in relation to how y changes, and you can create new invariants that way around. This is, I'll talk about it in a little more detail later on, but this is basically, uh, I skipped the story for now. Um, okay, um, pictures are beautiful, but they don't end up in correct pr reasoning principles. Yeah? So correct reasoning principles, they look like this. Here's a proof rule that says, in order to prove that P, if it was true before, it is true after, all we need to do is look at the differential of P. I should become more precise about defining that, but that's the shape of the proof rule, and I'll do that. Differential cut, that's this proof rule, the one that says that if I know by this guy that a certain condition C is always true after the ODE, then from that point on, instead of proving P for the original dynamics, I can prove P for the dynamics that in addition assumes C. So it has the you know, domain constraint modified. A dangerous <coughs> operation is to change the domain constraint of your system dynamics around, because this is an assumption, but it's a justified one. It's a pseudo restriction because I first proved that I can't leave C anyhow, so I might as well put that in as a restriction from now on. Yeah? This is the analogy, to, for those of you who have seen logic, this is the analogy to the Gerhard Kensen style cut. You prove C on the right-hand side, and then you assume C on the left-hand side, except now for different equations. Yeah? Differential ghosts, the way they work is that they say, well, if you have a question about an ODE, how about you ask a question about a more complicated ODE? Why should that help? Well, a more complicated ODE that has extra differential equations with extra dynamics in it, and then answer another question, G is an invariant for it, which is equivalent to P in the sense that P, if and only if there is a Y for, for which G holds true. Um, that sounds like a stupid thing to do, as I mentioned, because bumping up the dimension of the problem seems to make matters worse. But that's the style often in mathematics. If you don't succeed with a question, make it more complicated. Um, same principle here as well. By the way, super subtle. Is this proof rule the correct one? Can I use it from now on or not? Or is there a counterexample? where I dreamed up a very, 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 very bad ODE. You make G to be the same as P? Um, I can't because this is a logical formula yeah, and this sorry, is a... Sorry, the same as F and G the same as P. I can, that's, not a, that's actually not a problem because I, can, I could dream up a new ODE that doesn't help, that doesn't make my problem any easier because in that case, I would like have a copy of the ODE. That didn't help me. I have a new name for the old problem. But that's not a catastrophe. That's just bad proof search. Yeah. If, if, it solution, it if it doesn't have a solution, or, I mean, everything here is like polynomial rational, so they all do. But if the solution dies out too quickly, right? That would be the thing that is not acceptable, right? We can't say, oh, yeah, so indeed. So the side condition is that, you know, only throw in things that actually have a global solution is a bit too strong. But something that, whose solution exists for too, for, for long enough, right? So linear in Y, for example, is a great idea. Yeah? Because it's not a good idea to say, uh, well, my car will not die because if I compose it with an ODE that you know, makes the universe crash in half a split second, until then I was very safe. <laughs> because still your car could have been unsafe in five minutes, but you made the universe explode before. That doesn't help. Yeah? So this is the, thank you, extremely important side condition here that we only admit ODEs that don't damage the existence of the universe, which is a good principle anyhow. Tell your friends in nuclear physics that that's important. Good. So these are the proof rules. Um, and it's time for an actual example. Here's the French equation whose solution or whose, you know, whose plot in, in phase space looked like that and whose plot over time looked like this. And it happens to be true that um, this set is an invariant. So omega squared, x squared plus y squared, let's equal some something, something, something. Yeah? 
And how do I find out? Well, first I give myself some intuition by plotting this green region. And indeed, if I start here, yeah, I'll always stay in there. Yeah? This is some uh, damped oscillator thingy going on. And let's not worry about solutions to these things. Let's just do proofs. Proofs are easier than solutions anyhow. So we do a proof by deriving this guy, forming the differential, which takes us to 2 omega squared xx prime plus 2y y prime, less or equal 0, because c doesn't have a derivative to speak of. And then we keep around a discrete shadow of this ODE, by which I mean an assignment that says to the variable x prime, and now I assign the value y, because that's what my ODE apparently does. And to the variable y prime, I assign this guy. You know, because that's apparently what my ODE does. And then here I say, well, assignments, we know what to do with assignments. That's easy. So by plugging in, uh, you know, for x prime, I plug in y, and for y prime, I plug in this guy. You know? So replacing the left-hand side of the ODE by the right-hand side of the ODE is what's really going on. I replace this with that, and here I have arithmetic, which is very easy to prove again, because this guy cancels with that guy, and this guy is negative because d is positive and omega is positive. Zero, never mind. Okay? And again, we have a very short three-line proof, and we're done with the question, which is the way I like to do proofs, if, if at all possible. To motivate the use of differential cuts, let us remember that we very much needed to know that the damping coefficient is non-negative for this proof to work out. Because it isn't true for a negative damping coefficient. In anti-damping cases, we don't stay inside this region. You know, because then we're adding energy into the whole thing. This is just taking energy away. You know. So, But if I then change the dynamics around to add a totally made up arbitrary d prime equals 7, that's just to make my pictures beautiful, but it's not important what it is. If I now say, ha, 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 d changes, yeah? d changes according to d prime equals 7, then the question is, will we still stay inside this region? And the answer is yes, because what we then have sort of increasingly damped oscillators. So damping, damped oscillators in which, in addition, the damping coefficient ke keeps on getting stronger. In other words, what happens is that you spiral a little bit quicker or so. You know? But other than that, you're still staying inside this region. But the old proof doesn't work because, you know, f for this guy, if only I knew that d is greater or equal to 0, my old proof would work. Remember? Because this question doesn't depend on d, but it did its answer needed to know that the damping coefficient is non negative. Suppose we do a differential cut in which we first ask is it indeed true that the damping coefficient is always greater or equal to 0? with this d prime equals 7 guy? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then we remember, oh, apparently I have license to assume from now on that the damping coefficient is greater or equal to 0 because I just proved that it will stay greater or equal to 0 if it is greater or equal to 0 in the beginning. OK, so that should have gone into my assumptions here. I just didn't have enough space on the slides. OK, but if we assume that the damping coefficient is non-negative in the beginning and changes like that, then we prove it stays above 0 which gives us a license up here to assume that it stays above 0, and then the old proof works. Of course, this guy down here we also need to prove. We can't just write down conjectures and call it a day. We have to prove it too, but this is a total piece of cake because if we, again, by differential invariance principles, uh, prime the post condition, we get the differential d prime greater equal 0. Instead of d prime, we write down the right-hand side of the ODE. 7 is a totally arbitrary made-up number. If it would have been a complicated term, fine, as long as we can prove that it's greater equal 0. Um, and then we copy this knowledge back up with the differential cut, and then we continue the exact same old proof. Except that the d greater equal 0 here, we had to invest more effort to even get it into our evolution domain constraint in the increasingly damped case, compared to the ordinary damped case where it was part of the construction. Where does this eventuality come in? Okay, can you clarify what you mean by eventuality? Do you mean that in the sense of the diamond? Uh, uh, sorry, no. Um, here you're just saying d prime is uh, positive. Hmm? And we could very well start with a negative d. Right? No, you shouldn't be starting with a negative d. I misspoke. Uh, you, can, you have to start with, an, with a d greater or equal zero, with a non-negative d. Right? 
it, what its dynamics is is not so important. I happen to have chosen the dynamics d prime equals 7 for the sake of the slide. Would you choose another dynamics about which you can prove that you're always greater equal to 0? For example, by choosing some stupid right-hand side, x squared, y squared, plus x squared, plus 79 minus blah, 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 something that happens to also always be greater equal to 0, then the same proof works. That's what I meant. OK. Intuition clear, what we're doing and why that sort of thing is actually now a rigorous proof. And let's make it more rigorous. Yes? So I would expect somehow that somewhere you have the solution to be because you can then solve that one and then you can use that. I could have in this case because the ODE is so simple, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I, we don't work. So solutions are stupid things <laughs> for us <laughs> in the following sense that uh, if we work with a, an ODE solver, well, the ODE solver had better be correct. You know, otherwise, we have a beautiful proof built on a stupid ODE solver that lied to us, which all, many of them do. So we, that's what the reason why we don't do it like that. We also have a tactic that you say, please solve this. And then precisely what will happen behind the scenes is that the Chimera X will go off on a bit, little bit of a journey and prove for you that something that you specified or that Chimera X computed is an actual solution of the ODE. But it will be the proof that it is a solution of the ODE. It won't be an assumption that it is a solution of the ODE. And as you see in this case, um, you know, worrying about the solution of the ODE would have been already more complicated even in this trivial case compared to just doing differential variance reasoning because differential variance reasoning will dr differentiate, which makes the degrees go down, which makes arithmetic happy. You know? So differential variance are super helpful, succinct artifacts that tell us why things are true. So if we can prove something with just differential variance, we should always do that because solutions are just more complicated. Yeah. Remember, uh, ODEs are local descriptions of global phenomena. And we, if we preserve locality, as we do here, never have I talked about time or solution. Arguments get simpler. Yeah. So it's a good thing to do that. OK. I just mentioned that we could also, not in this case, it's not obvious, but, but in other cases, we could have cut in multiple formulas and went in a, in, a, in a loop. But let's make things a little bit more rigorous. So what we really do here is we add the differential operator into the term language. So the term language has addition and multiplication and you know, subtraction and division if you want. But, but the important thing is that we're now throwing in differentials. So whenever we have a term E, the differential of the, of the term will also be a new term, which just needs some meaning, right? Because by the logic, logical trinity, everything has syntax, semantics, and axiomatics. Now I gave you syntax, but the question is, what on earth does it mean? The meaning is, you know, is a function from state to real number. Uh, what is the meaning of prime in a state? It is not defined, and there are at least 12 papers on the hybrid systems verification that are simply unsound because they got this wrong, because they thought that they could differentiate something, something, somewhere, and haven't been paying close enough attention to the fact that you can't differentiate in places when you only have a single point, for example, or something that might be a single point. Because derivatives need something around the point, too. Derivatives in the point are not very meaningful. So you can't do anything like your local your native reflex would be, ah, I guess I differentiate by time. But there is no time in an isolated state. It's not meaningful. Yeah? So it depends on the ODE. But it's also not reasonable to say that the meaning of an expression should depend on the ODE about which it is used. That's crap. That's not compositional. That's not proper denotational semantics. So we're not doing that either. But instead, uh, the right way to do is to understand differential forms, and maybe even creatively misunderstand them, but to say that the meaning of E prime is a function that maps every point in the state space along with the vector that it happens to have at that moment to a real number. And so the meaning of the differential E prime in a state is a, you know, this funny expression which says, you know, partially derive the value of e with respect to every variable that you happen to be able to find at that state, and then multiply with the co-state, multiply with the value that x prime, x prime happens to have. And then as axioms, you know, I said syntax semantics axioms is the logical trinity. As axioms, you will find that indeed e plus k prime happens to be equal to e prime plus k prime. But this is now just an equation. It's nothing arcane or strange or meta level or, or, or anything like that. Nothing where programs are involved, just a happy little fact. 
or you will find that indeed the differential of a product is the same as the left one differential times the right one plus the left one times the right one differential. But it's just a little fact, right? It's just an equation that happens to be true. And we also find that the differential of a constant symbol is zero because constant symbols don't change value ever so often. Right? They never do. And the differential of a variable is just you know, the corresponding x prime symbol. Very easy. Uh, in fact, it's useful to remind yourselves about the act, what were the actual semantics of ODEs. I sort of glossed over it with pure intuition early on. But the meaning of an ODE is that along an ODE, x prime equals f of x within q, you can go from any old state phi of time 0 to a new state phi of time r for any time r um, if you know the solution phi fits to the ODE x prime equals f of x and this fitting to this ODE is exactly with this notion where you say well I guess here along an ODE x prime had better mean the time derivative of x but only along an ODE are time derivatives even meaningful otherwise x primes could mean anything they want and then what we do is we say that, well, I guess the one thing we really know for sure along an ODE is that x prime is supposed to equal f of x, right? Because if my ODE says x prime equals f of x, then I guess x prime has the value f of x. That's what it means to follow an ODE. In other words, any formula P is true along an ODE if and only if it is true after I again assign into x prime the value f of x that it already has. This is a no-op operation. But it's a rather useful no-op operation because it communicates to us the value that x prime must have at the moment. And remember, in our intuitive differential invariance reasoning, this was one of the steps we made. We said, dear ODE, can I just keep your value around as an assignment? Because I'll need it later on. Walid, you did raise your arm. Yes. No, 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 either question or time. <laughs> No, no, I have a question at a time. You can't alert me to both. Yeah, it's hard to explain yeah? so you can decide whether it's a tricky question or not. Is it a complicated one, in which case I'll defer to offline? Yeah, I was going to ask about on the previous slide about the different parts of the semantics of these functions. And so we can Let's do that offline. This is partial derivative, very classical mathematics. Like or, uh, extensional. Numerical, right? Right? Extensional, exactly, right? But you see them aligned here in a second. Yep. So, uh, uh, my, my intuition is just from a fear about this differentiation. So, suppose you have jumps, for example, in your system. Doesn't matter. So, we again are exploiting multidynamical systems principles, right? We are exploring the fact that during a continuous phase, <coughs> continuous systems are easy, discrete <coughs> systems are easy. We just need to make sure we compose them together into, uh, you know, with compositional language principles into an, a well defined system. So, in a jump, derivatives are not very meaningful. <laughs> Right? Maybe left derivatives, right derivatives, all kinds of complicated things, but not derivatives, which is not of significance to us because our reasoning is compositional. So whenever we do worry about ODE things, we will be in a situation where time derivatives are defined. But we have to pay close attention to that to make sure that things don't go haywire. Right? OK, good. Uh, so indeed, along an ODE, it so happens that the value at time z of the e prime differential happens to coincide with the time derivative of the expression e at time z, but it's you know, just a coincidence. But the point is, on the left-hand side, you have the value of something syntactic, the e prime term. is just some funny syntactic construct. Chimera x has primes. On the right hand side, we have an analytic process, right? The definition of d by dt, of course, we learned about it in, in, in real analysis and calculus classes and so on. But explaining this side to a computer is much more work than explaining the syntactic side to a computer. They're in agreement because of the equality and the lemma, right? But we do, do prove this correctness once, and we never have to worry about it. We never have to go back. Likewise, these equations. Uh, you know, these are the ordinary laws of differentiation. We grew up with them ever since high school. But the point is here they turn into equations of differentials, which is something that has very clear semantic meaning locally in isolated states. This is a differential of a term that happens to be a plus. This is a plus of two terms that happen to be differentials. And the equation, that's just a logical formula. It's nothing special or complicated about it. Likewise with the other guys. These are just logical formulas, nothing special about them. It's just the fact that these equations happen to be true logical formulas, which I need to remember 
in axioms, which means these will be four of the axioms that we will squeeze into our system from now. Copy-paste, remember. This guy, the fact that along an ODE, I guess x prime has the value f of x, that we can easily squeeze into our system by, as an axiom by saying that a property p is true for an ODE, if and only if for the same ODE the property p is true after I assign x prime f of x. Yeah. That's a triviality too, right? This is a differential effect axiom, the one that helps us copy the, you know, there's multiple ways of understanding that, but the best way of understanding it is the one that helps us copy the, the instantaneous effect of an ODE on its prime variable into our reasoning from now on. Um, and then the easiest way of internalizing the one above is, for example, for the greater or equal zero case where we say, well, the differential variance uh, axiom for the greater or equal zero case is that um, if along the ODE E prime is greater or equal zero, so it's differential, which we can reason through with the upper cases, then along the ODE E is greater or equal zero if and only if E is greater or equal zero right now. So things are true all the time if and only if they're true right now, all by the power of the differential invariance reasoning principles. And so it goes with all the other ones. So there's a list of axioms. You remember the 10 I showed you a little while ago. These are for CPSs, and then there's these extra about 10 axioms that are for reasoning with the French equations. And you don't really seriously need much more about that. Um, in fact, this one is too cute to skip. Differential ghosts. Here's a simple example. If x is positive, it will stay positive along the x prime equals minus x dynamics. But the problem is the trend is bad, right? It looks like it's going down. It looks like, you know, if you do the trend analysis, that it might ultimately go negative. Uh, but by the differential ghost principle, you can say, well, maybe I find something that holds it up. Some other variable that talks about the energy that is apparently disappearing in the system and stashes it into the variable y. So let me write down y prime equals, oops, I don't know yet. Yeah? So it's about some new differential equation. Um, and then we'll say, well, OK, how do I have to cho choose the post condition? I can transform the post condition x positive to x y squared equals 1, because they happen to be equivalent. Right? If x y squared is 1, then I guess x must have been positive, and the other way around, too. If x is positive, then no matter what square I, no matter what, what you know, there's always a y such that x y squared is 1. It's just a, one over square root of it. But it's not so important. It's very easy to prove this equivalence here. And then instead, I prove that um, x squared square equals 1 is an invariant of my system. I still haven't said what the ODE is, which might make you worry. But everything is fair while you're constructing a proof. When you're set it, checking a proof at the end, you know, it should be more rigorous. Yeah? In fact, there also is a super rigorous way of making that true during, proof, during constru proof construction. I just am skipping those details. And then you say, well, differential invariance reasoning. So x, y squared equals 1. That gives me x prime y squared plus 2 times x, y, y prime equals 0, right? <laughs> I ha still haven't told you what that is. <laughs> uh, but I can plug it in. I can plug in funny cloud for y prime. And I can plug in minus x for x prime. I get this expression. What do I do? Solve for the cloud, right? <laughs> I solve for the cloud and say, well, that's easy to solve. All I need to do is plug in y over 2 everywhere. And then the one thing I need to check extra is that the thing I happen to have constructed here happens to have a long enough solution, which, because it is linear in y, is by construction. And that's the end of the proof. It's now a, OK, maybe six-line proof, but it was completely deterministically constructed out of the question. Yeah? Uh, so this is like. Um, dark matter for proofs. Uh, you know, physics people look at the universe and say, ah, my energy invariants don't balance out. That's weird. Let me invent something that I can't observe. Let's call it dark matter. And all of a sudden, my energy invariants work out again. Here's the, sort of the same principle. You also have you know, some dynamics that's awkward. You invent something arbitrarily that has nothing to do with your original system, but it happens to capture the loss of energy in good ways and together You've harmonized the universe by saying, well, I, I have a beautiful new syntactic energy, but who cares? <coughs> it's an energy invariant, and then I can prove that it happens to be an actual invariant of the system. 
and do more proofs from that. So yes? Or from construction, because uh, you know, if you think about what is the what is a, a formula that mentions an extra variable and is equivalent to the original question whether x is positive, this is the one. It's not quite right. There's others too, yeah. but they're also they're all completely deterministically constructed out of the question. We have a tactic that does that for people, but you know, maybe first few times around it's useful to do that sort of on your own manually just to learn about things. So in fact, when you just put auto in Chimera X, it does all kinds of things automatically. But whenever our automation times out because it gave up or so, or whenever you want to learn how these things go, doing these proofs manually is more, is, is more useful. Yeah. You can also do that in useful cases, for example, for figuring out when a parachute, um, when you need to open a parachute before you drop to the, to the ground and so on. This is an example that I invite you to go through. It is specifically crafted to be the simple most example that still exercises lots and lots of reasoning techniques. <laughs> uh, so you learn a lot of what you need to do in real examples in a very, very simple context. So you sh you're invited to figure this one out. Um, and in instead, I'll tell you a few things about something slightly more real, which is actually much more real, I guess, yeah? more real than parachutes. Um, the uh, upcoming next generation airborne collision avoidance system, AKSX, which is being designed by the FAA to replace the currently operational one. And um, because they were not so happy with the way how the original TCAS system was designed in the 70s as a big breakthrough to um, you know, stop a number of unfortunate near mid-air collisions and has had tremendous <laughs> impact to make matters better, better since then. But also, you know, science by and large evolved since the 70s. So they, the FAA had to start fresh. It had a fresh start with the AKSX system design, and, and they used decision theoretic methods with a Markov decision process to design, um, you know, in quite systematic ways, a discretized version of uh, the behavior of the aircraft and then optimize on a cluster of a thousand computers for two weeks until they find out, find a, a policy that is good, and then ship this policy to the aircraft, which does interpolation to find out what it needs to be doing. And for example, what it would, what it would need to be doing is if the, in relative coordinates, if in, in another intruder aircraft is down here and your aircraft is up here, then you need to figure out is a climb advisory, a good advisory to be giving to the air, aircraft. And in this case it is because even if the pilot has a bit of a delay during which he might have initiated the descent until he realizes the system said climb and then the, aircraft, the pilot climbs and everything is fine because indeed the two did not uh, intersect. But of course you have to predict that ahead of time and so on. Uh, they approached us and said please verify this thing because it's a hybrid system which is of course true but it's also a large one because it has uh, in this five dimensional state space with interpolation about half a trillion modes or something like that, which is hybrid, but also very hybrid. So instead, what we did is identify safe regions symbolically in sort of this gigantic table, and then verify safety of the system in Chimera X, and then subsequently compare. Um, and the good news about the comparison is that, that about 97.7% of the half a trillion states uh, of the system are indeed provably safe according to our uh, Chimera X proofs. Um, the more annoying news is that you have about 15 billion counter examples. Uh, here's, for example, one where the pilot used to be on the stashed path, and for some reason, in some of the cases, the AKSX system says, do not climb if the other aircraft is here. And the problem is that if the pilot actually listens and doesn't climb, but then that's causing a collision. Everything would have been fine on this path, but if they work like that, it's not so useful. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, and they said that's wonderful, but uh, you know we need we need less counter examples. Where am I going? That's wonderful, but we need less counter examples than 15 billion. And then then we looked at the notion of um, what happens of last chance to see. So what are the actually I think <coughs> what are the cases where the system gives advice which it can ultimately still recover from by giving a different advice. For example, it would say climb, and later on say, ah, I meant this end. Um, or it will say climb, and later on say, actually, you need to climb some more. Yeah. So climb at 1,500 feet per minute per second, and then later on say climb at 2,500 feet per minute per second. Um, 
and um, and then you know the number of counterexamples goes down because there's cases in the system where the first advice was a bad one, but you can still make up for it by later on issuing another advice. Of course, the problem is that pilots don't like to be told different things over at different times. So you can argue which decisions are good or bad, but they have a lot of operational suitability conditions to to keep in mind. Of course, also which we as safety verification people happily ignore. Um, and in that case, um, the number of counterexamples drops uh, considerably uh, to uh, 31 million to uh, about 900 million. I think the 900 million is more accurate of an assessment than the 31 million counterexamples, but at least it's much better out of the uh, <clears throat> half a trillion cases. And here's one, for example, where the system in, in these circumstances says um, maintain, meaning, dear pilot, please don't move, basically, right, or move within you know, a small region around it. Uh, but if it does that, and <coughs> even one second later, there's no good action anymore. Because if one second later the, the aircraft says, well, it maintains some more, then they would get into a, a, a you know, near mid air collision. And if they would say climb uh, one second later, and even if the pilot reacts instantaneously, they're also still too close. But if um, at that moment the system would have said climb 1,500 right away, then everything would have been fine. And some more cases and some. We've already talked about these guys. I want to acknowledge, uh, of course, the help of the students and postdocs in my group, without whom this would have been a totally impossible enterprise to do. There's also a number of um, additional uh, case studies and so on that you can check out on the Chimera X web pages and so on. And of course, the support by uh, the funding. Uh, and um, wrap up by saying that. Uh, about the logical foundations for cyber-physical systems, the logical foundations do make a gigantic difference to CPSs, but also the other way around, because there's a number of questions in logic that aren't meaningful to ask until you have the CPS context. And there are a number of questions in CPS that aren't meaningful to ask until you have the right logic perspective, like what's with this prime? What do they mean? How do I make this rigorous? How do I make sure that there are no more possible soundness glitches in the arguments? And what's the smallest number of reasoning principles that I can reduce everything to? And it's just differential variance and differential ghosts and differential cuts, very simple reasoning principles. Or these differential uh, axioms that allow you to you know, manipulate the massage primes in syntactic ways where you once and for all figured out why that's correct and then just you do, do, do this completely mechanically in a syntactic way and, and, and you know, leverage and explore different reasoning principles. This overall is this, you know, gives you strong analytic foundations, but also lots of practical reasoning advances that we exploit in our Chimera X theory improver with significant implications, but also a, a, you know, opportunity to catalyze many uh, science areas. And the trick for us was to exploit multidynamical systems where, you know, there's separate things, discrete dynamics, continuous dynamics, adversarial dynamics, stochastic dynamics, that you, you know, pull together to a multidynamical systems and then continue to exploit that during the analysis by always saying, I have a big question. Let me successively decompose that into smaller questions, at which point I will only have just a question but an ODE, and here's a list of three things I can be doing to my ODE, for example. But also, you know, even though on the theoretical side you can tame complexity quite a lot with that, and you even have a completeness guarantee for it, so not just sound, but also a complete exomatization. There's still you know, numerous wonders that remain to be discovered on a lot of you know, potential for, for further work, where these are sort of pointers that are you know, one important step in that direction, but certainly not the last word on it. So I invite you to check those, check those out and do good progress on these things. And, I'd, um, and of course, um, um, uh, please also look into this uh, Logical Foundations of Cyber-Physical Systems book about which a draft copy is floating around here that you can look into some more, which is going to appear um, later this year and is priced quite competitively, competitively in order to make sure that, I think, 40-something or so euros or so, in order to make sure that you know, it's, it's, it's quite affordable for everybody. And with that, I'll give you more time for questions. Thank you. derivative symbol in the expressions. Uh, do I understand correctly that you are allowed to use them when you flow, but if you have uh, 
Mm. You're always allowed to use them. So it's very important for a proper logic design that you say the language is an actual language. Every operator is always allowed, and every operator always carries meaning, and every reasoning principle you ever do with it always preserves the soundness of it. And that's precisely what we make happen with these differentials. The point is, these differentials, they're always these local differential forms. The semantics is always, oh, take the term, derive it by all the variables, multiply with the co-state x prime. Yeah? The point is that sometimes, namely along an ODE, the value that those differentials happen to have happens to coincide with our intuition of a time derivative. They always have a meaning. They always have a value. These equations of differentials are always true. We can always use every syntactic transformation we ever learn about them in any arbitrary context. It's completely context-free. But sometimes, namely during an ODE, which is when we most need them, uh, they happen to align quite nicely with the time derivative, which is what we need to understand, for example, things like, is this a constant time derivative? Is this time derivative greater or equal zero all the time? Is, how does this time derivative relate to that one? But reasoning exclusively about time derivatives is a dangerous concept. I just point to the about 12 papers that are unsound in hybrid systems or education for super subtle reasons. We avoid that problem by embedding everything into, inside a logic in which you can very freely, arbitrarily you know, mix your primes and your non-primes and your ordinary terms and your differential equations and your dynamics and your reasoning. And any reasoning you ever do with that is always guaranteed to be sound. So that's how you can like, make quite flexible, fast-paced reasoning progress without having to constantly worry about, wait, was the step OK? Was the step OK? In fact, our tactics in Chimera X they very aggressively march forward and speculate and say, well, yeah, let me do that reasoning step. Because most of the time, that sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah? I know sometimes this is garbage, this reasoning step. But I'll do it anyways, because our sentence critical core with these small you know, 10, 20-ish axioms will catch me in the rare cases where this would be incorrect. So this is a liberating thing for you know, algorithm design for hybrid systems analysis, because you can very quickly, with tactics, prototype your algorithm it will do the safety analysis for you, and you can ignore all these tedious side conditions of, wait, 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 when was that OK? Uh, because it's all checked somewhere under the hood. <coughs> Seems like we've either run out of questions or out of steam. Depends on how you measure the size, right? It depends a lot on how you measure the size. So I think a lot of our case studies are are complex in very different ways. Some of our and this is intentional because you know, a kind of question that we already know we can answer. That's a not a very interesting one for us to ask ourselves as a, as, a, as a prover designer, right? Because if we know we can do this, so okay, let's not do it, <laughs> right? So a lot of our questions are either, for example, we've got some systems with you know 60-dimensional uh, nonlinear differential equations, which happen to just prove autom fully automatically or so. Uh, there's other questions, like for example, the AKSX question, where the differential equations are actually not so bad, but these gigantic you know 15 um, uh, half a trillion mode switches and half a trillion modes of the hybrid system and, and so on. These are really, really bad. So there's a tremendous complexity in the discrete part of the system and so on. There's other parts where um, you know, it's the rather finicky interaction of, uh, oh my god, this is actually only fine if, for example, well, never mind, for example, roundabout maneuvers and, and also some other ones on, on robots where you say, this is really only fine on the very, very, very thin corridor, right? So this is a system that's almost never safe, only when the conditions are exactly aligned like that. And then, of course, you know the the, the verification argument becomes complicated because of that, right? Or we've got um, you know, fully automatic invariant generation and proving for the longitudinal dynamics of an aircraft, so the six degree of freedom aircraft models and so on, where the continuous dynamics is. Is a, is a huge challenge, uh, but the discrete dynamics isn't so bad. So it really depends a little bit. You can you can find complexities in many different ways, and, and, and or for example, also distributed hybrid systems are are distributed hybrid systems <coughs> proofs where we have proofs about in, infinite dimensional systems and so on. That's the reason why they're complicated, but it's not so much there. 
they are a differential equation. When they're not solvable, OK, uh, but, but they're not arbitrarily bad either. Yeah. It depends a little bit on their background. So um, we've had people come from industry or, 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 or government research labs and so on, come and you know, learn about chimera proving in, in, in about two weeks and get productive in that time. Yeah. Uh, but what is certainly true is that anything, I mean, the world is a complicated place. So we can't expect a push button solution to solve all problems for us. If, if that's the case, we've asked the wrong questions. <laughs> They're too simple. Right? So we usually tend to ask the actual application questions, which means that our automation is going to do the best it can to, to, to you know, verify that. And for example, with these, uh, with these 60 dimensional nonlinear ODEs, and so it happens to have fallen into a case where our current prover automation says, yeah, I know what to do with that. I can generate all the invariants and differential invariants and differential cuts and all kinds of things for you, and, and you happen to have a proof and you're happy. But you know, if you ask a different question, you know, our automation might fail. We have a completeness guarantee that you know, if it's true, there's a proof in a certain sense, right? But, but it's a bit of a different question how fast it'll, it'll, you know, the automatic invariant generation techniques will work. Um, and from that perspective, it's super helpful, for example, also for the students in the, in the undergraduate course on cyber-physical systems that this book is based on, for them to not just rely on all, all of our automation, uh, but also learn, so in the beginning we are slightly cruel and take all the automation away from them in order to make sure that they understand how the reasoning works in simpler contexts, which would just go like a breeze. Everything I showed today would just have been a push button automatic proof, but then you wouldn't have seen what happens. Um, and under those circumstances, it's important to do a little bit more. And getting that, getting up to speed with these kinds of things has taken our collaborators about two weeks or so. Right? And I'm Thank you.